After we'd lifted them off the machine, we'd load them onto shelves in the alleyways along the drying shed. These shelves, or deals as they're called, can take up to 4,000 tiles along the alleyways in the shed. And as we filled the deals, the tile making machine was pushed along so it was easy to stack the tiles. In my day, there was no concrete and the floor of the drying shed was just earth. So if it was wet, it was very muddy and slape or slippery. There were metal strips to push it along and if you allowed it to tip off them, then you'd be in real trouble. It was the devil's own job to get it back on again. We'd leave the tiles in the drying sheds for up to about a couple of weeks or so, so they'd lose just about all the moisture. You couldn't put them into the kilns if they weren't dry, they just wouldn't fire. And it was a skillful job to know just how long to leave them. The doors and the shutters would be left open or closed, uh, quite often during drying, depending on whether it was wet or dry or hot or cold outside. In the winter, if there was any chance of frost, the yard wouldn't make any tiles. If the frost got into the clay, the tiles would shatter when you put them in the kiln. So often the tile yards would shut down during winter and some men got laid off. One job that carried on was digging clay. So those who didn't stay behind to do that job would find work elsewhere during winter. Most likely they'd get taken back again during springtime when we started making again. That would be from about April. And then after two weeks or so of drying time, it was back to the wheelbarrows again and we'd have to take all the dry tiles to the kiln. The kiln is a huge, thick-walled brick building with vents in the floor and fire points around the sides. You'd start to load it up with a few layers of bricks put down in a checkered pattern to allow the hot air to move around. Of course, one good thing was the tile yards could make their own bricks to do this with. Then the tiles would be stacked on top and when the kiln was full up, we'd have to brick up the entrance door and cover it all in pug. A pug was quite simply mud, or warp as we used to call it. In the old days, you'd collect it from the river's edge and mix it with sand to make a very crude form of mortar. There are still roads around here called Warp Lane. I suppose that's where they used to collect the mud from. We had to do that so that uh, the cold air couldn't get into the kiln and the heat couldn't get out. When we'd done all that, the uh, fires were filled with coal to keep on burning. The coal would come up to the yard up the River Humber, usually from collieries in the south or west riding of Yorkshire. They'd deliver every eight weeks or so, and when they arrived, we got pulled off the job we was doing to help them un unload the barge of coal. We used to do this pretty much as we used to move the clay around, be barrow. Each tile yard had a jetty and you'd move onto the boat with an empty barrow and then come back to the coal shed with a full one. The kiln full of tiles was sealed and fired up on a Saturday usually. The heat from the fires is funneled to the top of the kiln and then drawn down through the vents in the floor and up and away through the chimney. That's why they're called downdraft kilns. The fires would burn slowly from Saturday to about Monday tea time. And then from tea time to midnight, they'd be mended every three quarters of an hour to really keep the heat up. There were peepholes around the kiln, but you couldn't really see that much through them. Sometimes you could tell what the state of the burn was by looking at how much smoke or steam was coming out of the chimney. All day Tuesday, the fires were kept up high until sometime on Wednesday, when if it was reckoned that the tiles were ready, bricks would be put on top of the fire and it would be covered over with pug. This would dampen down and stop any air getting in. The kiln would be left to cool then until the following Saturday when we'd unbrick the doors and take all the tiles out and start the old thing over again. Throughout the tile yards, men would be known as good tile burners for their skill at knowing just when the tiles would be ready. 
My grandfather was well known hereabouts as a good tile burner, and very proud of it he was too. He and me gran used to live in this little house, actually in the tile yard. It's still here, but of course it's not used anymore now. At that time, they had a horse to pull cartloads of clay from the dig into the mill. Nothing's left now except the empty, closed up stables. When Grandad was young, tile yards were communities in their own right, with shops and a school and church and so on. Tile yard workers never had much need to travel even as far as Barton. When the tiles were ready, it was back to the good old wheelbarrows once more, and we'd stack them ready to be taken away to fill orders. When I first started work, they would often be taken by boat or barge to places like Boston, Yarmouth, Harwich or London. There'd be different kinds of boat, depending on where they was being delivered. This is the type of barge that we'd see regularly bringing coal to the yard or calling to take the finished tiles away. Aye, back then, the river would be positively busy with traffic like this. They say that the bed of the River Umber from Barton to Grimsby is paved with Lincolnshire tiles chucked overboard in bad weather. Later on though, they went off by rail and then by road. When we was loading up, my grandad used to watch like a hawk because it was a matter of pride that you never ever sent a crack. Things have changed nowadays, I must admit, but not quite as much as you might think. Some of the strenuous physical tasks we had to do were done by machine now, like digging the clay. And of course, we don't have to struggle through mud for 500 yards, uh, balancing heavy clay on a wheelbarrow. The mixing machine, which we had to turn behind, runs off a little motor now. Of course, we still have to barrow the dowels around the yard and take them from the, the mixer to the tile-making machine, but that runs off a little motor too. The floor of the drying shed is now nice, smooth concrete, so no danger of falling flat on your backside in the mud. And uh, it's easier to push the uh, machines along the alleyways now. And as for the kiln, they've got a new instrument now which can tell them what the temperature is inside. No more guesswork. There's one thing that's nice to know, that Lincolnshire tile yards are still turning out a product that's in demand all over the country. Second to you might say. And we left quite a nice little legacy too, a beneficial byproduct you could call it. Some of the fishing ponds hereabouts were old clay works that got flooded and of course they make quite a haven for wildlife too. 